Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Victory Church. Today is our worship service number 173, January 19, 2020. Would you join me in prayer? Please stand up. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you for this beautiful day of life. We thank you, Lord, that we can be together singing songs to you, Lord, giving you glory and honor because you deserve, Lord, to be worshipped. Here we are, Lord, ready to sing to you, ready to worship you, Lord, because you are wonderful and we love you with all our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Can you hear, Lord? 
I'm not a warrior I'm too afraid to lose I feel I'm qualified For what you're calling me to Lord with your strength I've got no excuse Cause broken people are Exactly who you use So give me faith like Daniel In the lion's den Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. So give me heart like David, Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. We took a shepherd boy, made him a king. So I'm gonna trust you and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror, cause you fight for me. I'll be a champion, claiming your victory. So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. I'm going to sing and shout and shake the walls. I won't stop until I see him fall. going to stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, Jesus. I'm going to sing and shout and shake the walls. I won't stop until I see him fall. going to stand up, step out when you call. Jesus. Faith like Daniel's in the dying stand. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's stand. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. I'll face my giants with confidence. For our viewers, we want you to know that uh, this coming Tuesday, we will have our Bible study as we do every Tuesday. 6 p.m., we will have dinner. At 7 p.m., we will do our Bible study.
could ever come close no thing can compare you're our living home your presence Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence worship our Lord through our offerings. Whether it is through an envelope here in church or online. Let's give to God what belongs to Him. Thank you, Lord, for all your provision. We love you, Lord. 
Why are we here? Why are we doing this, Lord? Why do we get together in this place? Why, Lord? There must be a special reason why we do what we do. And you are that special reason, Lord. You deserve, Lord, our effort. You deserve, Lord, our time. You deserve our gratitude. You deserve our adoration. You deserve that we surrender to you, Lord. We are happy to be in your presence because you make us happy, Lord. Not people, not things, not anything but you, Lord. You are wonderful, excellent, worthy to be praised. And in your presence, Lord, we receive wonderful, wonderful blessings. Because we are your children. Yes, we are. Yes, we are, Lord. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Yes, Lord, in your presence. Lord, I'm asking you, to pour down more of your Holy Spirit right now here among us, Lord. Touch the heart that is so thirsty for you, Lord. Touch the body that needs healing. Touch the mind that needs peace. Touch the relationships that are destroyed or in trouble, Lord, and bring peace into those relationships. Bring healing into bodies, Lord. Bring provision to those who are in so much need, Lord. Because we are your children, Lord. And we believe that you are a good father that can give us all that, Lord. You set us free, Lord. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, we are, Lord. And we worship you, Lord, in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. The time has come for us to receive God's word. We have praised him, adored him, and worshiped him. Now we will hear a powerful message that our Lord has poured down into our pastor's heart. Let's get ready to receive the inspiration that we need this week to go into battle with faith in our Lord Jesus. Let's give a hand to our Lord God and all together say, one, two, three, victory. Yay, Lord. Our viewers, please go to the website and download the bulletin if you like. We all have our bulletins here and we are ready to go with this message, how to deal with problematic people. January 19, 2020, worship service number 173. Well, the first thing that I have to say is that sometimes we are the problematic people. Don't you think? Because usually what we say is uh, they are problematic. That person is problematic. You know, he is really problematic. I'm not problematic. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Sometimes we are problematic. You, know, you have to just come with me to a restaurant and you will see how problematic kind of customers I am. You know, my steak, I want it this way. And I want this on this side. And I want you to cut this. And the poor waitress is just, okay. And what is she thinking? Oh, he's problematic. You know, and I always say that from the beginning, I said, I am a problematic customer, just so you know. Okay, they go. <laughs> because we all want things our way. But the graphic that you see right now on the screen tells you about something that can happen to some people. You know, they get into situations that you are wondering how that happened. <laughs> do, you, do you have friends like that, that sometimes they tell you a story and you're thinking, and how that happened? 
I would like to know what did you do? What, you were, what were you thinking? <laughs> right? And sometimes it's us, the one that is in trouble. And just the others are laughing at us and say, really? Well, it happens. It happens. And how do we deal with those things? I want to share with you some ideas. The first thing that I would like to share with you is there are two, two angles to this situation. You know, when you are dealing with people that are really problematic and you know maybe you are thinking of somebody or several people, I want you to know that you, you need to go this from two angles. The first angle is you need to be very patient and tolerant with those that are in trouble. You have to. Think about this. When you were in trouble, when you were in different kind of situations, isn't it that what you wanted from others? To be a little bit patient with you and tolerant because you made mistake after mistake? Well, that is what they need from us. We need to be patient. We need to be tolerant. But it's not easy, right? Sometimes we just go, you're calling me again. You're texting me again. I already fixed that thing. You know, how many times do I have to do this, <laughs> etc.? Yes, we need to be patient and tolerant. But on the other hand, my friends, we need to set our boundaries. We have to. Because unfortunately, there are people that uh, they just take advantage of your kindness. You know what I am talking about. They see that you are generous, that you are willing to help. And what do they do? They try to milk the cow, right? Just more and more and more. Then is when you need to set your boundaries and you say, listen, enough is enough. I have done this, I did that, but there is a limit. And, and you are the only one that can make that decision. Nobody else will make it for you. You have to set the boundaries. And on the other hand, sometimes you find those individuals that they are in so much trouble and after you have helped them, they say to you, they have the audacity to say to you, I'm in trouble because of you. It's your fault. And you are thinking, what? Why am I now responsible for your disaster? Then is when you need to show self-respect. You have to show self-respect. You need to think about yourself in a, I will say, very objective way. Have you helped those people in trouble? No, I haven't. Okay, well, you better do something. No, yes, I have. Okay, have you done enough for them? Have you talked to these people about this and that and analyzed all the angles and possibilities? Well, I have. I have been very patient with them. But they are just keep on going. And now they are blaming me. Then is when you need to stop it. You need to learn to stop certain people. And it's not easy. Why? Because especially for us believers, we want to be nice people, right? Have you seen anyone who claims to be a believer and is thinking, I want to be a mean believer, you know? <laughs> Have you heard of anybody saying something like that? You know, I just love the idea of being a mean Christian. Yeah. I want people to know that I am mean. No. It's the opposite. Believers, we all believers, we are just thinking, I wish people will know that I am nice. Right? And because of that, it is hard for us to say, no, enough is enough. This is the limit. I cannot help you anymore. And when they are blaming you, please listen carefully to this. If somebody is blaming you for their disaster, stop that person. If you have to take certain actions in order to stop certain people, you have to do it. Simple actions that I have seen they start with blocking the phone number, blocking the person on Facebook or social media, and then we go to the next level, right? Restraining orders. Some people, they, they just need to go through all the extreme of that, you know? It is sad, but when you are thinking of how you can help people that are in trouble, keep that in mind. There are two angles. You need to be patient and tolerant, but at the same time, you set your boundaries and show self-respect in the house. You know, if there is something that bothers me, I'm visiting somebody and I'm in that house and then I see one of the kids being disrespectful to the parents. You know, I don't intervene right away. I always give them a little bit of time. And I say to the dad or the mom, 
Why are you allowing this kid doing this to you? And if they don't say anything or whatever, then I speak. And I call this kid and I said, come here. I want to talk to you about something. How old are you? Such and such. Okay. Who pays for your food? Who pays for this house? Who takes care of you? Okay, so you better respect your parents. You better respect your aunt, your grandma, whoever, right? Respect, show, show, show some respect. In restaurants, I have been in, in restaurants with some of my friends. And we go there sometimes, especially grandparents, you know, you know how, how we are, right, as grandparents. We want to give everything to the kids. So we are in the restaurant, then the kids, we go to the uh, counter, whatever, and, and we are, hey, how you doing? You know, we are excited. How we doing? Good, good, good. I would like a number one with mustard and a number three with this, please. And we are smiling and nice to the person taking care of us, right? And then there is this mean kid. And he goes, four. That's, that's the way you ask? You need to show self-respect by putting this kid in his place. Do not allow my friend's kids to respect you, grandkids, nieces, nephews, etc. No, no, no. You need to show self-respect. If you don't show self-respect, no, no, no. Let me say that from other, from other angle. If you do not have self-respect, nobody will respect you. That's the point. You need to respect yourself. You set the boundaries, then you will show the self-respect. Okay, but moving to the next thing. I want you to know something very interesting. Many people don't know about this. And there are scriptures in Luke 10, 18, Ezekiel 28, and Revelation 20, 10 about Satan. I, as you know, I don't talk much about that cockroach, that bug. I don't like to talk about him and his deals because I just don't think it's necessary. I already know it's defeated. Defeated. The Lord Jesus said something in Luke 10, 18. I saw him going down from heaven. Ezekiel 28 tells us the story of how Satan, who was beautiful and magnificent in his creation, because the Lord created him, he rebelled against God. You see, as an issue of authority here, he wanted to be like God. And then the Lord said, you want to be like me? Well, I will show you what I'll do to you. Bing! Out! And Revelation 20.10 tells us the story about his end. We already know he can touch us. Satan can touch us. First of all, because the Lord Jesus already gave his life for our salvation, his blood. I'm untouchable. He cannot do anything to me. He cannot do anything to you. If you are under that coverage, salvation. That's why you don't pay attention to that cockroach, you see? You ignore him. You are free. You are blessed. Don't, don't fear him at all, okay? You have authority of, over him. You just say, out of here. I don't want you here. All right, but the best part of this deal is in Revelation 20.10 that tells us the end of his story. He's going to be going to the, this lake of burning sulfur to be punished, listen, forever and ever and ever for all the evil things he has done. Yay, God. I like that. I like to see all the evil being destroyed by the good Lord God Almighty because he is wonderful to his children. Now, but this, this is the deal. Satan knows what's his destination. He knows about his end. So he is miserable. Do you see that? He knows he's already defeated. He is miserable. Therefore, what is his goal constantly? Is to make us miserable. Believers don't see that. Many believers even don't know about this deal. They just know that constantly they live in misery. I am in misery for this reason. I am in misery for this other reason. And you can give me the list of 25,000 reasons why you can be miserable. And I will tell you, don't do it. Don't allow the enemy 
be happy fulfilling his goal to make you feel miserable. It doesn't matter what their circumstances are. You just have to refuse to be miserable. You just need to enjoy your life and rejoice in the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. But every time you are miserable because of you don't have the money, you don't have the person, you don't have the this, you don't have this, that you don't have that. Every time you are miserable, guess who is happy? Yeah. So don't buy that. That's why you have to just focus on God and say, no, I'm not going to do that. And the problem is when you see people that are problematic and sometimes they give you trouble, what is the feeling? You feel miserable, right? Because you see this person going through so much and you are like, you talk with your friends, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing good, but I'm just really overwhelmed right now because, because of what? Because of the problem somebody has. I'm not saying we are going to, to be uh, not sensitive to the needs of our people. No, we need to be considerate. But what we cannot do, my friends, is to be miserable because of the problems, whether they are our problems or somebody else's problems. Refuse to be miserable. Say it with me, please. I refuse to be miserable. Again, I refuse to be miserable. Period. It's the enemy's trap. Now, what if someone wants to fight with you? What if this person that is in trouble now wants to fight with you? Three things I suggest you. Number one, you have to be strong. And be strong in the Lord. Not be strong in your own strength, you know? Like, uh, don't tell me that because I'm going to kick you. No, no, no. But be strong in the Lord. How do you become strong in the Lord? I will tell you the secret. You pray. You pray. Guys, listen to this. Many believers feel that they need to have somebody to tell them their problems because that person cares. That person pays attention. Somehow it makes sense. But the truth of the matter is no one can fix those problems. Only God can fix those problems. My friend watching, if you think that you have to find somebody that is a true loyal friend that will listen to you when you are in trouble and this and that, you will be looking for the rest of your life and you will never find that because nobody will have the patience to listen to your problems day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. You know what will happen? Those that are willing to listen to you, you eventually will find that they are tired of that and then they will say goodbye to you. You need to talk to God about your situations. Somebody is trying to fight against you. You can say, fine, let's fight. And then you go, Father, in the name of Jesus, I don't know what to do this situation. <laughs> Whatever, you know, you just pray. You have to go there to prepare, to get the strength. Listen to this, please. You go to, him, to the Lord in prayer. You get the strength from heaven, and then you will be strong in the presence of whoever. You know why so many people are weak? Because don't pray. They don't pray. They don't talk to the Lord. That means that maybe when you are weak, it's because you are not praying enough. You are just maybe thinking about it and telling everybody about your problems. But the Lord, get your strength from God. Second, you have to be smart. Some people, especially in the workplace or business, they want to fight with you. And they want to beat you up. They want to win, right? Okay, you have to be smart. You need to find ways to defend yourself. And what is the best way to do it? With records. Always get copy of your stuff. In the workplace, you know, sometimes there are mean people. They are problematic. Could be your supervisor or coworker, customer, whoever. Get copies of those things. There are text messages. Print them. Make a copy of that. Take pictures of stuff. Protect yourself. Defend yourself with records. Third, Pick your battles. You know that there are people that are mentally challenged. You know that. Some people really, they are not right here. 
in their minds. They are kind of nuts. You need to pick your battles. Some people that are like that, <laughs> it's a waste of your time. So pick your battles, okay? All right, let's go to the next point. You know that when you are dealing with problematic people, there is a lot of stress going on. <laughs> there is so much tension. It's too much sometimes. And you need to make a decision about that because if you allow that stress eat you, you are going to end sick. You will end in the hospital. And eventually some people can have strokes, heart attacks because of the stress. So you need to make a decision. You say, mm -mm, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to allow all these things just overwhelm me and then I'm dying here. You know, no, 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 no. You need to focus on life and enjoy your day. How many of you have said, thank you, God, for this day? Don't, don't answer, please. I just want you to think about it. How many of you this morning, when you got up, when you woke up, you said, thank you, Lord, for life? That's the beginning of the solution. Focus on life and enjoy your day. What is what you like to drink? Get that drink. What do you like to eat? Eat that thing. Enjoy your day. Enjoy it. You know that the one occasion, a group of people caught a woman in the act of adultery and brought the woman to the Lord Jesus. You have heard that story from other places and perhaps from me. And you know that bothers me that they only brought the woman. They never brought the men. That bothers me. Because it's, it's you know, it's, it's a reality. There is so much injustice against women. I, I see that. And not, it's not new, you know that, especially in the past, you know. It has been so unfair, the attack against women. This is a perfect example. There is adultery, meaning two people having sex that they did not marry. They only brought the woman. <laughs> How about that? Unfair, right? Okay, well, all these people are accusing this woman. John chapter 8. The Lord Jesus hears the story and he goes down to the floor and he starts writing on the ground. The scripture doesn't tell us what is what he wrote. But it says that everyone there was there. One at a time started to leave, starting with the oldest. <laughs> the oldest people started to leave the place. The woman... Is there just looking. Those that are accusing her are leaving. The Lord Jesus said, anyone, he who has never sinned, should throw the first stone at her. So when you are thinking of problematic people around you, you need to be careful to not become judgmental to their situations. You are not better than them. Do you understand that? Yes. Sometimes, with all respect, the level of a stupidity of certain actions is just unbearable. It's true. You know, one of my friends told me the other day something so funny. He said he was driving at 75 miles an hour. He struck with his brother. In town, <laughs> not in the highway. And he said that he went directly to, to a house. They were, you know, Jupiter and Saturn combined. You know what I mean? Boom! Hit the house. And he says the worst part is that we hit the office of this guy. The guy, the owner, the homeowner, <laughs> had an office there. And he did certain job. I don't remember what job. But all the paperwork <laughs> was flying everywhere and he said and you know what's the worst part of that i said what the only thing that i got was this little scar this little scar here he was fine because the level of stupidity of our actions sometimes is just unbearable it's just unbelievable what kind of stupidity we all can do we all we know what we're what i am saying right now Therefore, 
We are not better than the rest, my friends. We need to keep in mind that. That when we are dealing with problematic people, we cannot put them down and just say, you stupid, I don't want to deal with you. No, 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 no. Remember when we are saying, you are doing something, there is one finger going there. My friend, how many fingers do you see pointing me? <coughs> Three. Watch out. It's true. They are difficult, but we are not better than them. The point is we need to put our joy in the Lord. We need to make sure that the Lord will be our happiness. Not stuff, not people. You have to get it. You have to get it. It's the Lord. The only one that will make you happy permanently, constantly, deeply, for real, and forever. Not stuff and not people. No. And the problem is you know very well that between God and us, there is always something called sin. And you know what is the issue that we have in this particular situations with problematic people? Is that we cannot forgive them. You need to learn to forgive and let it go. You have to learn to forgive. The lack of forgiveness is a sin. I want you to say that with me, please. The lack of forgiveness is a sin. So when you don't want to forgive somebody, you are sinning. And that is between you and God. You have to get rid of it. Matthew 6, 14 says, If you forgive others for the wrongs they do to you, then your Father in heaven will also forgive your wrongs. Clear, right? We need to forgive them. It doesn't matter what they do. Yeah, they are problematic. It's so wrong. It's just they cross the line and all that. But you have to learn to forgive those people. When, when you are able really to, to forgive people, you know that you have to do it through a prayer. You have to talk to the Lord about it. More or less what you do is, wherever you are, you can even be in your car. It doesn't matter. The Lord said, when you pray, go to your private room, meaning you have to be by yourself. You see? So you are by yourself, and then you pray. And I want you for a second, please, to picture the kind of situations that you are going through right now and the kind of problems that are around you and the kind of people that are going through all their troubles, okay? Picture them. So you see the whole scenario around you. You are trying to be at peace with God. You are searching God for an answer. So when you see all that, then is when you pray. And then you say something like this, Lord, I am aware that my life is not right now in a good place because of these people, right? It's what we feel, correct? Don't tell me no, because it's what we feel. Because Lord, this, this, and we start crying, right? And we start calling these people names, correct? Is not that what we do? It is. In the, and after, when we are going through all that, what is what happens? We start having tears in our eyes. And that is good. It's healthy for you to cry in the presence of God. And then at that moment is when you say the words, Father, and I, from the bottom of my heart, I forgive such and such. Is what we need to do. And it hurts, right? Because we would like to say, destroy them, destroy them, do something, right? But, but no, we have to say, Lord, I forgive them. And then the, the most difficult part comes when you say, and I want you to I want you to bless them. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. You are not saying it from your heart. You are so angry. You are so frustrated. You don't want any blessings. 
but it's the right thing to do. It's like when we get injured. You cut yourself, there is an infection. What is the right thing to do? You need to clean and put whatever you know. It hurts, but it's the right thing to do. You have to forgive. There are tears. And what happens after that? <sighs> there is so much peace. You will have peace. The peace that you are looking for, you will find it in God. And when you have that peace, then you play the songs. And then you like the songs. And you are moving. You are saying, Lord, you are good. Great are you, Lord. Suddenly you start to move a little bit more. You change to another song. You are listening a new song. You are by yourself. Five minutes later, you are what? Dancing. And then you have joy. You see? It's a process. And that is what makes you strong. I hope you understood. Luke 15, 11 through 32. Erroneously, from my viewpoint, okay, from my viewpoint, with all the respect that I have for theologians for hundreds and hundreds of years, I disagree with the name that they put in the Bible about this story. They call him the prodigal son. To me, the story is not about the son. The story is about the father. If I would name the Bible in this chapter, this portion, I would name that section the patient father. Because all the credit here is about the father. It has nothing to do with the prodigal son. One was an you-know-what, and the other was mean. <laughs> what has to do with the son here? It's all about the father. But I need you to see here this story now from a very interesting perspective. It's the father's perspective. Here's the father who has, has money, two sons. One is asking for the inheritance, and he allows him to take it. And, you know, half of his money is out, so he's not that wealthy anymore. And now they need to figure out what to do with all the responsibilities they have and the farm and the animals and employees and all that. The other son is very angry for that reason. But the, the first one takes off, and you know what happened. He wasted all the money. Here's the father. The father hears the first song asking for the money. He knows what, what is going to happen. You know exactly what is going to happen when someone comes and asks you for money for, for a project. <laughs> you know that money is gone. It's not going to come back ever. It's going to be wasted. And you're just thinking, and I work all that for all those years to do that for this really son? But this father, for, for the purpose of the teaching, the lesson the Lord Jesus wanted to give us, allowed him to take half of the inheritance. And the kid took off. The father is brokenhearted, but he thought, you know what? If I made that money once, I can make it again. Now here's the second son that comes. Really, dad? Really? What are you thinking? You know, the mean brother. So the father needed to put up with that and try to pacify him and then starting a new business and whatever in order to come back to where they were. Patient with the first one, patient with the second one. Patient with himself. But every night this, this man, this father is praying, Lord, I don't know where my son is. I am sure he's having a blast right now with all my money. Living la vida loca. Oh, oh, I hate him. But I love him. Bring him back to me, please. One day, the next day, Lord God, wherever my son is, please bring him back to me. Next week, Lord God, I don't know where my son is. I have no news. Protect him. Preserve his life. Bring him back to me. Months passed by, I don't know how long, but the father was faithfully praying for his son. 
So this son who took the money, he did something really wrong. We know that. And we know what happened with him. He wasted all the money, and now he's eating there, trying to eat the food from the pigs. He's broke, broke, broke. But here's the father. Somehow he, he gets the feeling this boy is in trouble. That's God with us. We do so many stupid things, my friends. We waste time, money, energy. We know what we do until we are there broke, broke, broke. Broken hearted or broken financially or health or whatever. We are in trouble. And here is the father. Patiently waiting. Say with me the word, please. Waiting. Waiting. It has nothing to do with the son. It has to do with the father. Because if it was us, this is what we will do. Hey, employee number one, come here. Do me a favor. Uh, here is uh, 5,000. Do me a favor. I'm dying to know what's going on with my boy. You know, I love this kid. I know he's an idiot. But you know what? It's my son, okay? So don't say anything. Do me a favor. Get this money and go and look for him. And if you see him in trouble, make sure that at least he has something to eat, okay? And uh, that is what happened. He sensed probably this. This is what we will do. When we see people in trouble that we love, we unfortunately don't wait here until the time comes for this person to repent. Oh, no, we don't do that. We don't do that. We always want to know how is this person doing. Oh, poor, poor him, poor her, poor them, poor, poor, oh, I feel bad, I feel bad. It's a mistake. You have to see it. It's a mistake. You have to wait, trusting in God that this person will repent. If this person doesn't repent, 5,000 more, 10,000 more, the other half will not fix his life. So stop putting your hands in the life of troubled people because you think you're going to save them. That's a mistake. You have to see it. Let them suffer for a while. The only way that they can repent is when they touch that bottom line. When they are there, rock bottom, when they are suffering. Unfortunately, people that are troubled that they don't understand, they are not reasonable, they have to go to that point to comprehend their mistake. And then they repent. And when they repent, they come back to you. Here's the father. This is the story in Luke 15. Here's the father, the top of the mountain. Probably he did that every day. It's like us checking. Did he text me? No. Any emails? Something in the mail? We are waiting, right? Trusting in God is going to come back to me. That day he was there. And when he saw at the distance the figure of his son... <laughs> <laughs> this, this old guy, he was overwhelmed of joy, of joy. He just looked up at heaven and said, Lord God, you brought him back to me. Thank you. And he started running. Now imagine that's you running because the one that hurt you, the one that made so much trouble for you, finally is coming back to you. You go and you receive this person with love. But before you say anything, you have to hear the words. The son says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I don't deserve to be called your son anymore. If only I am your employee, I'll be happy to be here in your house. Repentance has to do with confession. Don't make it easy when they are coming back to you. Don't make it easy. Wait. 
Let the person come back to you and speak the words to show you that there is repentance. Not that you are mean. It's necessary for their own sake. I hope you understand that. You have to. But all it starts with your heart. When you put your heart in the right place, my happiness is the Lord. It's not that boy. It's not that son. It's not that wife. It's not that family. It's not that nothing. Nothing ain't nobody. The Lord alone. Patient father. But I want to close today, reading to you some verses of psalms written by David that are amazing. These are parts of prayers that he said that, oof, my gosh, it's, this is just amazing, amazing scriptures. And for those that have here the bulletin, you can write this now or later, but I want you to hear it and see it on the screen. How beautiful. He does, the Lord, the Lord does not ignore those who need help. He does not hate them. He does not turn away from them. He listens when they cry for help. Our descendants will serve him. Those who are not yet born will be told about him. Each generation will tell their children about the good things the Lord has done. That is what we do. We, that's why it's beautiful to have kids in the house of God. That is why it's good for us to share with the children about the Bible because they need to hear about the great things the Lord has done. The earth and everything on it belong to the Lord. The world and all its, belong, its people belong to Him. Meaning something so simple. When the Lord wants you to have something, whether it's people or stuff, it's going to come to you. It's going to come to you. Because it belongs to him. Don't get upset about evil people. Don't be jealous of those who do wrong. No, don't do that. Trust in the Lord and do good. Live on your land and be dependable. Whatever you have to do, do it. Enjoy it. Do it. Enjoy serving the Lord and he will give you whatever you ask for. You know, in our church, I'm so blessed to have many wonderful members. But I am greatly blessed having a wonderful team of close members that are working with me constantly to begin with my wife. Serving God together. Mama, Tony, Al, Penny, you guys, Ronnie, Wendy, the rest of you guys, Charlie, Chad, and others that are not here right now. But what is what we do? We serve God. I wish, my friend watching, I wish that you could understand the beauty of serving God when you stop being selfish. Stop thinking about yourself only. What else what you want? What can you get now? How you can get that thing fixed? Serve God. Serve Him. He's worthy to be served. Trust in the Lord and wait quietly for His help. We, we said that before. You just pray and wait on Him. Wait on Him and say, it's going to happen. In the name of the Lord, one day it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Lord, you are my light and my salvation. Why should I be afraid of anyone? The Lord is where my life is safe, so I will be afraid of no one. No one. But I really believe that I will see the Lord's goodness before I die. Be strong and brave and wait for the Lord's help. What a beautiful passage. Beautiful passages of the scripture. Do you want to give your life to God, my friend? Would you like to give your whole heart to Him? Would you like to repent, surrender before the Lord? This is the time. There is a prayer here in the screen. Say it with me. Dear God, I really hope that you will help me to understand my life. I need to change my Lord. I need to learn. I must be able to live my life with intelligence 
Also, I understand that you are unhappy with my own actions. I need you, Lord. Please forgive me for all my sins. I open my heart to you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I surrender to you. I hope that you will guide me. I truly hope that you will make me new today. In the name of Jesus. With faith in your heart, receive that blessing, that forgiveness. All together, we say, I am forgiven and saved by faith in Jesus. Therefore, I can also declare my life is going to be great and blessed this year, 2020. Amen. Woohoo! Friends, receive the blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have a beautiful weekend. Enjoy your family and friends. See you next time. Anytime a heart turns from darkness to light. Anytime temptation comes and someone stands to fight. Anytime somebody lives to serve and not be served. Victory Church. We hope you enjoyed the video.